Dann heiße ich Sie herzlich willkommen zum zweiten Wahlgespräch des 27. Filmfests Hamburg. Mein Name ist Hanna Pilatzik und ich freue mich sehr, durch den Abend mit Celine Siama führen zu dürfen. Bitte nochmal einen Applaus für Celine Siama. Hallo. Wir haben eine Stunde für das Gespräch anberaumt. Ich würde sagen, wir sprechen so 40, 45 Minuten zu zweit und dann würde ich auch noch mal eben Ihre Fragen gerne annehmen. Wenn, wir sprechen auf Englisch. Wenn es Fragen wegen eines bestimmten Worts gibt oder eine akute Sachfrage, dann auch gerne reinrufen, damit wir es gleich klären können. Ansonsten Ihre Fragen dann für den späteren Teil aufbewahren. Is this going to be in German? Yes. Okay. You're not ready. Don't worry. No. So Celine Siema is one of the filmmakers of the present. The um, Film Fest Hamburg has uh, dedicated a small semi-homage, semi-retrospective uh, to. And um, I just wanted to uh, ask you first, and do you feel mid-career? Are you in the middle of your career where you get these honors? Well, I'm in my prime. <laughs> so I don't know if that's the middle of something or the climax of something. Um, I, you know what, I, I never know what I'm going to do next when I just release the film. So to me, it always feels like the end of the road. <laughs> so I like the fact that this is all semi, semi homage, semi retrospective, because, you know, if you say so, I might have still things to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe for those who aren't familiar with um, most of her works, um, let me tell you a little anecdote. Um, back in 2016 at the Cannes Festival, there was a small animated movie in the Kazan des Réalisateurs. It was only for one hour. It was for kids. It was directed by Claude Barras. And the main character was called after a vegetable. But the cinema was packed. And for the first time, I had chants about the screenwriter. And the people were chanting, Céline, Céline. And I think um, that's when I realize um, people are here for the same reason as I. When Celine Siama has written a movie, it's got to be special. And tonight we are going to talk about what makes your movie special, when you choose to direct your own stuff, when you give it away, and maybe talk about the way um, you set up your film sets. Um, how is that p political and how you also uh, are engaged in the 50-50 initiative? And... Um, That's a lot for one evening, so <laughs> we just start. Um, when I um, talk about the special things you add to uh, a movie, it's always think comes down to the empathy you have for your um, characters. And my first question would be, um, do you ever feel that you will do a movie where you don't like your characters? If I get bitter or uh, if I become really uh, a sad person, maybe. Um, but, um, no, I mean, I, I don't really see how, I mean, I don't have to be vigilant about loving my characters, you know, it's like when I've been doing interviews the whole day and, you know, one of the questions is always like, how do you do to not objectify your character? You know, how do you do to not do male gaze, for instance? And I'm like, it's not like, like I have to really just scratch my head and do, how do I do not to objectify a woman? It's quite easy, actually. You just have to decide. Um, I know, I'm not saying you can decide to love your characters, but I don't see why you should tell the story of somebody you wouldn't want to feel close to. Um, and mostly loving your characters is willing to share intimacy with them. So it's not about them being a good person. It's about, uh, yeah, it's about bringing to life an intimacy that you want because you share intimacy with them and hopefully people will share their intimacy of the character and share the experience. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> with, um, we've just said, this is um, filmmakers of the present um, talk, but, um, For you being a voice of the present, it was such a surprise to find you finally doing a period piece. When did you realize the next movie I'm going to make will be something that takes place in 1770? Why that year? Well, first it wasn't that, I wasn't that accurate about the period. I knew that I wanted to, to write a love story. 
that was the first thing. A movie that was dedicated to love, to I mean, to love being born, to the rise of desire and 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 mutual feeling between two characters in the present time, and also wanted to tell about um, the memory of the love story and what's left from a love story. So that was the the, the first desire. Uh, but also I wanted it to, to be uh, a love dialogue, but also a creative dialogue, a uh, dialogue around the arts. And, and I thought about painting because I felt it was close to cinema and to portrayal, but I didn't want to do a contemporary painter because, you know, it, it's not, it's, uh, otherwise I would have done a movie about a film, you know. Uh, so I went, that's when I decided to step in the, to take a step, a, a leap in the past. Um, and I went throughout art history uh, from the perspective of uh, women. Uh, there have always been women artists since, uh, you know, the cave men and women. Uh, when, you know, in, the, in, in, in prehistorical time, they would sign their, uh, their art with their hands printed on the wall. And when you look at the size of the hands, it's, they're small, so it could be teenagers or women. Um, but I definitely picked that 18th century moment because I, want, I wanted Vivaldi and also because I wanted um, the 18th century because it's, it's a very important moment for Europe, also for France, especially, of course, with the French Revolution and the Enlightenment and um, also regarding all the, 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 the speeches and, and the, the, the philosophy around the arts and what's representing somebody. That took place a lot at that time, um, but mostly it was also because I, I discovered, I knew uh, the stars of female painters at the time. You know, there was Elisabeth Vigilebrun, who, is, who was uh, Marie Antoinette's painter, one of Marie Antoinette's painters. There was Artemisia Gentileschi in Italy, there was Angelica Kaufman in England, um, but I actually came upon the body of work of hundreds of women who were painters at the time in France and throughout Europe. Um, and I didn't know they existed, and they had very flourishing careers. And it was, there was also a strong art critic, feminist and f female scenery, and, um, and I, I stumbled upon this, and it, it, it definitely um, gave me the urge to actually do the film and at that particular moment mm -hmm. in time. But um, it's also different, not only from the t um, time setting, but also the decoration is very sparse. What you expect from period pieces is signifiers saying, oh, this is 18th century, and um, then people are supposed to have this um, concrete image of the period. And you decided to have um, unpainted walls. The women only have two dresses each. It's like um, a bit of a dogma film for you, isn't it? How did that change your filmmaking? Well, actually, I decided to to go with the period piece as I did in my as the in the same logic. To me, it was the same job. Even regarding production, we keep it we kept it on a on a, on a scale that is you know uh, not big <laughs> um, because we want to keep we, we don't want to compromise and we want to be radical. So you know that's why also we have sometimes we keep it. Not cheap. We we need we want the money we need to make the film and to pay people good. Um, but um, uh, really, to me, it's the same job. It's just that it's officially a reconstitution. But cinema is always a reconstitution. If you even if you set your story in the contemporary world, you're gonna make the same choices. You have to choose the room. You have to choose the design of the room. You have to choose the costumes. You have to. Um, so it's, it's the same job, it's just on a different scale because it's official that you are reconstituting a world. Whereas in contemporary cinema, you know, we pretend we're like taking, you know, the atmosphere of the moment. Um, so to me it was the same process and I always try to keep, to keep it simple, to, to be on a very clear line. Each of my characters in my previous film, they don't have that many outfits, you know. It's always about the uniform, it's always about building the silhouette of the character and sticking to it. Um, and it's the same with the set design, you know. It's, it's actually this, I always have a very high level of intervention on the set's design, uh, and even though uh, so far, till the portrait of a Dion Fire was uh, 
basically filming teenage girls and children in uh, rooms in the Parisian suburbs. Still, these rooms, they were built. Mm -hmm. Most of them were built, totally built. Um, and this time, it's the opposite, actually. I met this castle. <laughs> I encountered this castle uh, within the Parisian suburbs um, and was untouched for centuries. Mm -hmm. Uh, the color of the wall, we didn't, ch we didn't change. The, all the, the, the walls, the wooden walls, they are original boiserie from that time. Um, so it's actually the set that I had less intervention on. Alors que... <laughs> I'm losing my... Um, so which is a paradox, because we're supposed to build, you're supposed to... So... I got lost. <laughs> No worries, I think we, we got to the point. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's funny that you mention or uh, describe your um, act directing job as intervention. We might come to collaborations later on. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to dwell on the fact um, with this movie there's um, limited um, resources when it comes to beauty because you decided to um, focus on um, the faces. Mm -hmm. And I think the most of the beauty comes from um, the skin, the luminous lighting, and I was wondering how many times um, did you have to talk with your uh, director of photography to get the colors right of the skins and, and the lightning? Well, we were pretty much focused on that. Um, everybody's telling us that every frame is a canvas, which is, we take the compliment, uh, of course, but we were laughing in advance with the DP, whose name is Claire Maton, who's a genius. Um, because it was, we had no reference whatsoever regarding to painting. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we went to the Louvre and we looked at a lot of frames, but to think about the work of the painter uh, that we were going to invent. But regarding the lightning of the film, we were obsessed with the fact that um, it had to be colorful, it had to be beautiful, and that the light would have to come out of the characters. Um, and we hesitated between 35 mm millimeters and digital. Um, and we did both, we tried both, and actually we chose digital because regarding the skin and the fact that you could feel the rush of blood coming to their cheekbones, mm -hmm. for instance, it was more dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and that, we, that was our goal. Our goal was to keep present to these women of the past, so it was about their skin, and it was about, yeah, the, the, their, their colors and the light coming out of them. Um, and so pretty much around them is pretty much nothing. Uh, they are at the center. Um, but it is not uh, a purely intellectual and artistic decision because I think it is also true. The, the, the aristocracy of Brittany at that time, you know, they could be really like, they didn't have a lot of money. Um, and um, and I think sociologically, even though that's an anachronism, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's not. You know, we didn't we didn't make up this imaginary world. It's not less imaginary than the way it is portrayed conventionally with all the accessories and the, like the little clock on the chimney. And mm -hmm. we decided to go with no furniture. So that must be true because I mean, we can say that. The furniture, the, you know, it's not less. It's it's not 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 a lesser truth than what we are used to, but we have this convention on, of how the past should be represented, and you, you feel sometimes the angst of filling the set and the frame with a lot of proof that you've been thinking about this and that you you know you 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 rented the good furniture so that it feels right, but I think sometimes this can be kind of this is, can blur the line, and if you want to be with the characters, you have to you have to look at them. And a lot of the furniture was built, actually. Like even her, I don't know what you call that, the thing where she paints, mm -hmm. the, the chevalet. Tripod, yeah. yeah. The, the mm -hmm. thing where she, mm -hmm. she puts the canvas. Yeah. This we made, the canvas that we made also ourselves, but with the right shape and the right uh, material from, I mean, it was very, very accurate. So everything that is in the frame is true. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, you've also created a set within the film with the three women, especially the two main characters, but also um, um, the, um, um, the maid. But um, after, I think it's mo mo almost one and a half hours, we only get to see these characters. There's one male, 
And before we get to the uh, triangle, um, I would want to ask you about the male character. Did you intentionally um, sh put, choose an ugly man? Because it's quite a shock when he's there. You're like, whoa! No, <laughs> There's so much bad beauty. Beauty. He's really cute, actually. He's a real sailor. Um, and, you know, we did an actor just to say hello. Um, even if it's difficult to say, to have a good hello, especially when it's your only life, because, you know, you want to do it super badly, like, hello. <laughs> like, no, this is too much. You will be dubbed. Um, but he's not ugly, actually. You thought, you, thought, you thought he was ugly? It's because you forget about men for an hour yeah, and a half. Exactly. And you're like, oh, they look like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they do, but you know, that's part, that's the beauty of cinema. That's the, that's the beauty of cinema. No, <laughs> forgetting about men for an hour and a half. No, the beauty of cinema is the experience, you know, the tools of cinema offer you that, that kind of experience. Like, there's one man in the beginning, he's not a bad guy, he's not a bad character, he's just somebody giving a hand, you know? He's like, he's, I don't know you say that. He's in the ram. And then he's just, you know, picking the portrait. He's just a handyman. Mm -hmm. um, but he feels like evil, you know. Mm -hmm. And because they're, they're out of the frame. And because we didn't want to lose time about portraying the oppression. We know the oppression mm -hmm. really well. So what you leave out of the frame defines the frame. And the frame is the world. So the domination is not inside the frame. But that means that you can feel it. And so it's just one man mm. stepping in the frame, suddenly it's like a, like a scare jump, and you experiment patriarchy as in a horror film. Um, and but, but that's new, that's not been done, you know, and I can, I'm in the room, I've done a lot of rooms, with mm. a lot of theaters with the film. Mm. People gasp at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm always there at that moment because that's when I come back from dinner uh, to do the Q and A's. <laughs> so <laughs> I heard a lot of <gasps> at that moment. And I think, you know, that's really, really fun. Mm -hmm. It's really fun that we should all get to experiment this as a collective and like being <gasps> amazed at this. And I, and, and I see people are very troubled with this, mm -hmm. especially in some, some men are not happy with that. They're saying, you're putting me in a very bad position. I say, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> but in order to achieve that kind of effect, you have to create this intimacy between um, the d two main characters. And um, I guess that's something you create on your set as well, because um, it's mainly uh, females on your set, isn't it? Well, it's really mixed. I mean, we have a lot, a lot of female on the set. Wow. A lot, a lot of female on the set. Um, but my set are not exclusively feminine, whereas it's, it's, it's the set of others, peop of other people that I don't understand. Nobody asks Jacques Audiard, why are your set all male? Mm -hmm. um, I think my sets are more mixed than most of the mm -hmm. sets. But it's true that there's a lot of women in charge, uh, and then they pick their team, and their team are mostly men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but men who are used to work under uh, the, the hierarchy of a woman. So it definitely creates another atmosphere. I mean. All, my, all the sets I know are, are mine. It's for the actors to tell the difference, actually. And the actresses, they, t they say it's, still, it's not the same. Um, but, you know, it's not only about m the presence of male or female on the set. It's mostly about the politics of the set. You can definitely have a very, very cool set with um, when all male, if you decide that you have, a, I mean, if you create the good politics and the good, um, or you could have a set with female that could be really, really with a strong hierarchy and a lot of trouble also, you know. So I think it's about how you lead the set and how you put, um, how you believe in collaborating with others. And I always wanted to make it really joyful um, because also, because I like to, I like things to be joyful, but also because I think the, the, the films, they look like the way they've done, they, they, they are being done. And uh, especially with this film, where there is a very strong politics of collaboration, I mean, we are actually um, trying to kill this idea of the muse with this fetishized, silent women inspiring just by the grace of a presence uh, and saying, no, that was, uh, you know, women, they didn't have the opportunity to be artists. They, they had very few, some of them were, but most of the opportunity they had to be in the workshop was actually to be a model. So it means that this was 
uh, the opportunity of creating, and they did seize that opportunity. They were one of the brains, they were the other brain in the room. Um, and so we acknowledge that, and if, if we tell that story, we also live that story, otherwise, you know, and that's what we did. But you're also not only um, active on your own set, you're also one of the initiators of the 50-50 by 2020 initiative. Maybe you, um, have you heard about this initiative about equal pay, equal rights at film sets? That's been, um, yeah. Okay. It's originated in Sweden, I think, and it was taken over in mostly in France, I think. It's got the most vocal support. Can you tell us about the work um, you've done there and how um, things are evolving right now? Well, that was a reaction to the fact that there was no Me Too in France. We had the, the backlash without the <laughs> Me Too, so it was really painful. It became uh, very quickly... Uh, and when I say very, very quickly, we're talking November when the uh, Weinstein case happened in uh, October, a cultural debate around the freedom of creation and freedom of speech. Uh, and feminist lectures would be, you know, censorship, that kind of thing. So we were feeling that we were, would miss the frame of a political opportunity. And we decided to uh, create a collective that would... Uh, work around the idea of repartition of power uh, in the rooms where we make decisions, where the decisions are taken. And so we decided to be um, a lobby, um, creating tools like pledge, for instance, or um, um, bonus for uh, films where there's a lot of women on the crew that are uh, traditionally underproduced financially to correct that. Um, and we made uh, a lot of festivals, including the Cannes Film Festival, signed a pledge uh, around transparency of the Committee of Selection and parity among the board. So it's a beginning. It's really about, it's not, it's not quotas, quote you know, we're not working on either representation or in, in the films, I mean, or um, tr trying to put the pressure on the fact that there should be more women selected in festivals. We are beginning the cultural battle in a place where we know we can actually win it. Um, it's a beginning, and it's also a way to address the situation politically so that the men in charge, the people in charge, uh, cannot just say, uh, you know, I'm the end of the road, you know, it should be about the schools and the selection, blah, 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 and so that it's always the last question at the press conference, and that, uh, you know, the head uh, the head of the, of the festivals are like, I'm gender blind, I, you know, I drink wine like that. Is it red or white? I don't know. So... We're trying to make it a political issue that they can't ignore, even though there might be, you know, they won't get sincere about it. Otherwise, you know, if they cared, they would have moved their ass before. But uh, at least they can't, we're trying to make it, yeah, to, uh, to make it political so that they can't just say, you know, it's, um, it's a matter of time. Because if we've, we've done the, the, the estimation, if, if we just follow the, the natural course of time, there will be, uh, parity in, the, in our industry in 50 years, and now we'll be dead. <laughs> there was um, one point that was constantly made in French discourse, which was puzzling, I think, outside of France, um, that said a uh, Me Too movement is moving towards Puritanism. It's about um, anti-sex, it's uh, against sensuality. It's anti-bad sex, yeah. but who cares, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah. but, um, you have a lot of immunity in your films, and I think um, these, um, this is still um, uh, There's not considered... a lot of nudity, but there's okay. nudity. I'm glad you think that there's a lot. It means that it works. It means that it's, that's two shots are enough to think like there's, there's nudity. I've, I've seen these women make it. Yeah, I've because it's very intimate. It's, um, yeah, yeah, but it's just two know... shots, two shots. Yeah, but also in um, Water Lilies. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're talking in general. Yeah, yeah. but um, th I think um, there are similarities when um, um, the bodies aren't shown in the actual sex act, but um, as a, a characterization, an additional layer to the character opening up to the audience. And this um, kind of nudity is something 
you, 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 one should be fighting for, and it's not, uh, it's com compatible with Me Too, and that's still puzzling to say this is a Puritan movement, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's that's more as well. I mean, that's uh, that's lazy. That's a lazy analyze of people not interested in changing the world or deconstruct themselves. Mm -hmm. We know that they, you know our enemies are lazy, but they have power. But uh, they are lazy. They are not thinking about this enough. You know that's what is driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that they they they, they, put, they they just reduce everything we do. And you know, and feminism has freed sexualities. Has always been. It's a movement of justice and freedom. So it's a movement of creation, of collective creation, of invention. It's a fiction. It's it's. I mean, it's it's an important fiction. Uh, so far, it's still a fiction, um, but uh, it's 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 a shame that they misread it that way, and they're not misreading it. They're just not at ease with what it's proposed because it's about them losing power. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's an offense to our brains, and 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 all and yeah, and all, all we're thinking and all we're doing. And it's an offense to creation to actually think that it will reduce things. Because, come on, if we talk about freedom of creation, are they really free to create? I mean, male gaze is basically convention. Uh, it's basically reproducing the same ideas of the power, and, and it, it rarely produces. There, there's a lot of masterpieces that are sexist, mm -hmm. you know. Um, do you still enjoy them, or do you? Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking at the past. I'm always looking at the present. It means I'm not a cinephile that's going to... When, when I take a plane, like I took a plane last year, and I said, oh, I'm going to watch Manhattan, a movie by Woody Allen. And, um, um, and I couldn't watch it because I was not interested. It's not, so it's not a principle. It's not like I'm not going to watch this Woody Allen movie. It's like I watch it and I'm bored. So, you know, we're, we can change, I mean, you know, our perspectives change, and we are all the product of male gaze, so we also have to deconstruct ourselves. Um, that's why I, I, am, I find it so shame that people are lazy with this, because, you know, we also have to, to go through this job. Mm -hmm. It's not like coming right away in my brain and uterus because I have one, it's just, you know, it's a job I have to do. It's, uh, it, I have, you have to put energy and will and heart and your heart into this. But it's so much interesting. It's so much, I mean, so much alive than sticking to respect the past without, you know, even giving the, the chance to actually, yeah, consider that uh, art is alive. So it's always about the present. And it's um, a, a beautiful thing. But I'm um, surprised that you wouldn't call yourself a cinephile because I thought with this film you also pay homage to the female painters you discovered, but also um, even just the title refers to Portrait of a Lady by Jane Campion or Portrait d'une jeune fille um, by Chantal Ackermann. So I thought this is um, you, you, you um, not create a tradition, but you make it visible. And I thought this is also a strategy for um, saying there's so much left out, we need to get it back into the conversation. Of course, but uh, d does, is this the definition of cinephile that you would find in the, if you hand the mic at the, at the, at the Cinémathèque, would they tell you cinephile is this? I mean... Um, Being aware of cinema's tradition, I guess so. Yes, aware of cinema tradition, of course. I'm aware of cinema's tradition. It's just that I don't spend a lot of time at looking at um, films from the past. It, I mean, and once I, I like, I don't rewatch him, for instance. I think that's my limit. Mm -hmm. I watch a film once, twice. It's pretty rare that I've seen a film three times. You know, it's. I'm always, I'm always into discovering new stuff. So that's why I don't consider myself a cinephile, which means a geek of cinema. Mm -hmm. I'm not a geek of cinema mm -hmm. um, because also my curiosity makes me go everywhere, and I'm not only into films. So, I mean, I don't watch like three films a week. I watch, it like, depends, you know, I was, as a teenager, I was a very hungry cinephile, and I could watch, that was all I was doing. Um, but, um, no, I know cinema, <laughs> but uh, 
I don't, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there are directors that are much more, I'm not into references. Like when people tell me like, what was your references for this film? I'm like, nothing. I'm really being really candid each time that I write a film. I'm not trying to belong uh, in the history of cinema. I'm trying to invent a grammar, a language for each film that I make. And this is not being orgulous, wanting to be, I don't know, the first one to do something. It's not about that. It's also about being modest, um, about trying to make something like, in the present, being very, very sincere also, and not, you know, wanting to wink at the past or at the present, saying like, I know this, you know, and, and, and I belong. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to belong mm. at all. Yeah, that's why your movie is the antithesis to uh, Joker, which only does the referencing of the past mm -hmm. in order to have a um, standing of its own. Um, but you've um, also written scripts for other directors, You've written Ma vie de Courgette, My name is Zucchini, and Quentin um, a 17 ans. Uh, why did you choose not to direct these? Well, I was not offered to direct this. There were directors involved. Um, and I really enjoy my job as a screenwriter um, because, well, you don't have to rely on your own desire. Uh, you don't have to make films to make a living as a director, mm -hmm. which I think is important. That's why I can take my time. Um, and it's really, it's really a super opportunity to get into somebody's brain and to get it. Um, and, it's, and it's different each time. I mean, f for instance, for my life as a zucchini, to write an animated movie for kids is an opportunity. It's a crazy opportunity. For André Teixeira's film, it's about working with somebody that I admire a lot and that Uh, really mattered in my early cinephile <laughs> days. Accepted. Um, <laughs> you are and cinephile. I, <laughs> and I get, to, I get to enter his matrix and understand his logic. And also, uh, being in the position of the screenwriter, is you, you, I always see it as a way... I don't disconnect it from directing. And it, as, I'm, as I'm a director, when I'm screenwriting for another director, I have a lot of ambition for the director he is. And for instance, with André Tichiné, I really wanted to look at him like a young director. And that's the, that's the beauty of this position, is that you can have an ambition for your colleague. And you know, you know, about, you know about this job, so you, 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 can, you can help them. You can have ambition for them, uh, knowing that you won't do it, and, and, but knowing the job. And, and I really enjoyed that, even though I really don't want to do it anymore, but... Uh, you don't want to write for anybody else again? I don't have any project, and um, I basically said no to everything that I was offered. Um, but you never know. I mean, something might come up. You know, the thing that I can project myself into is imagining a first-timer, a first-time women director coming to me with a project. And I think this is something I would do more than, because if I do the list of the directors in France today, I'm like, I'm not like, mm, I would love to work with this or that. I'm not, this is not the way I picture it. I don't have f fantasies about that. So it would be about meeting someone I don't know. So that's, that can happen anytime, <laughs> anywhere. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you've got, you got the message? <laughs> One theme that runs through um, the movies you've directed, but also um, wrote, is this idea of um, a summer of love, something special happening within a limited um, period of time. People are falling in love in your movies quite a lot, but we never get to see them stay in love. Why is that? Will there be a next Well, uh, if they are teenagers, I think it's a really good news that, we don't, that they don't stay in love. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't marry your first love, uh, especially when you're 14. Uh, and Tomboy, you know, she was 10, come on. We want to stay in love? No, go live your life. Um, <clears throat> Portrait of a Lady on Fire is quite different, of course, because it's a movie dedicated to love, and it has this ambition also of uh, this, um, talk about um, eternal love in a way, uh, and how love is a dynamic, how um, your sentimental education is about um, 
getting curious of future loves for people or for art or for moment. So that's quite different, I think. I think there's a luminous dynamic in the lost love of Portrait of a Diddy on Fire that says that it's not lost, it's something you win for life. Um, and that's a new dynamic that uh, of power that uh, and uh, that we that we embodied in this film. Um, I think you know to tell a love story, it has if you want to tell it, it has to has ended. Otherwise, you can't tell it. I think why because well, it's not received. Good. It's not. It. Um, I think that's why. I mean. You know, in our cult uh, culture, in occidental culture, um, the great tale of love is always about mutual love, but impossible. And, you know, from Romeo and Juliet to Titanic to Portrait of a Lady on Fire. But I don't think it's because we, we are messages. That is the right. <laughs> yeah. Lining up, e. I think. in there also. But <laughs> it, I, it's not about us being masochistic, I think. It's not about us wanting to suffer on screen. It's, um, it's a tale. And it has to be, it has to end so that you can actually tell it. And I think it's the same in life. I don't think it's really different. Uh, I think it's really easy to talk about the beginning of the love story with your friends, like it's the best conversation you can have. It's really difficult to talk about your love story while it's going on, no? To have like, and, but it's, it's, it's you, can, you can talk about it when it's over, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm not right, but I have the mic. <laughs> <laughs> you can do your flaming tribute to enduring love um, in a minute. But um, coming back to um, the period setting, um, Todd Haynes said when he did Carol, he also wanted to show um, a period when there wasn't um, gay liberation wasn't happening. It was in the 50s, and he said he wanted um, to also show um, the secret language between the women. And he said, I wanted to pay homage to this secret language that was kind of lost when we took to the streets because we opened up and we gave our codes away a bit. And he said he's yearning for this secret language, which is also very cinematic language. Was that something that inspired you to do a history piece as well? Um, no, actually. Uh, because I'm kind of, you know, it's like missing censorship, I think, is always weird. Um, in a way, no? Um, missing the lack of freedom because it was creative, I think, is weird. Um, it's not my political project. Um, you know, yeah, you can have you know people from the ancient times saying, "Oh, when we when we didn't have the right to be gay, it was cool because we were meeting in these places." Yeah, it produces a culture, and this culture is our heritage, and it's a beautiful culture, and we have to keep it alive. But um, I think <laughs> we're still pretty much secretive, and I think. We can invent. We invent a love dialogue that is different, actually. Um, but with more freedom, I think um, that doesn't make us less creative. I don't think it does. Um, and I wasn't actually trying to portray what it was like to love somebody at the time. Um, I'm trying to make it timeless. Um, because I believe it is. I believe, especially for women who didn't, we don't have the heritage of our uh, mothers and grandmothers and great great mothers. We don't know because they weren't allowed to express themselves, so there's no trace. Um, I feel like we have to bring continuity, not discontinuity. I think um, I'm trying to tell this intimacy as something that is still going on, that is our imaginary. Um, and it's, we can't be nostalgic. Um, we have to actually be, I don't know, to hold the thread. You have to, to me, it's, it's, it's the same. I believe that the intimacy that I'm portraying in portrait uh, is still vivid. It's still, it's kind of the same. 
and um, so I, I I don't know, but I think well, yeah, no, no, go, yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, other questions here from the audience. We can do German, French, and English, and you can do a mix. I speak one. Italian. Yeah. <laughs> Ciao, come stai. Yeah. So you uh, were saying that the beginning of the love story is the easier part to, and is a fun part to talk about with your friends and everything. So are you choosing the fun part, like to, to, talk, to tell the fun part story in your films? No, I make the difference between the conversations, conversation I have with my friends and the conversation I don't have with you, <laughs> even though we are friends. Uh, um, no, I mean, um, I think I really tried to, and tried really hard actually, that's what took me so long in the process of writing to tell it all. I really tried to tell it all. Um, but it's true that I decided to pay a lot of attention to this patient rise of first desire, because it's not only about filming love or telling love. Filming desire, telling about desire, is something we rarely do. The convention in cinema is coup de foudre. The convention in cinema is two people in, eleva in an elevator. They're good looking, because they're Ryan Gosling and Emma Thompson. Um, Emma Stone. Emma Thompson is, I think Emma Thompson is fucking hot, but uh, I would definitely take the elevator with Emma Thompson. Um, but, um, and, and, and you know, it's the convention that they're gonna love each other and you're totally agreed with this and it's really cool, by the way, you know, it's, a, it's one of the pleasures of cinema to go fast. Um, but I really wanted to show what it's like to fall in love really like step by step um, yeah, with the rise of desire and um, and actually scenes devoted to the first time that you actually feel desire. Uh, you know, like for instance, the painter, the first time that she actually feels desire for her model, you can, you feel it too, you know. She says, look at me, and then Eloise looks at her, there's a, a frame of Eloise looking at her, and then she she just she just loses it and there's a scene devoted to that so those steps are being watched really carefully and of course it's 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 um it's this choreography of what puts two people in a frame or in a bed um and um i'm not it's not it, it's not the funniest part. I'm not sure it's the funniest part, but it's a part worth telling. And and then there's the other part that is, yeah, what's left. Um, and I think we're telling that pretty accurately too. So you know, I'm not choosing. I'm not choosing. I'm trying to tell both. Bonsoir. Uh, moi, j'étais surprise en fait par la projection de Waterloo. Et euh, par le fait que vous ayez réussi à filmer toutes ces jeunes filles adolescentes qui sont mal avec leur corps, Adèle qui est extrêmement à l'aise a priori, euh, et je voulais savoir comment vous avez fait pour réussir à les mettre en confiance, pour réussir à, se faire, à accepter de se faire filmer comme ça, et souvent euh, nues ou en maillot de bain. Voilà. <coughs> So the question is about what release that was green earlier before and that you saw at that moment. It's the first time you saw it. Uh, and it was about how, you know, they are not at ease with their body, but still we are actually looking at this and how did we manage to get that going on? Um, well, you know, it's a matter of, I mean, they're not naked that much, I must say. There is no, there's one frontal nudity scene in the whole film, and otherwise, 
it's always they're always with their bathing suit. I'm saying that not to defend myself, but because it's as you said, you feel like there's a lot of nudity. There is very few. There's just one shot of no of the girl being totally naked. This sorry. Dans le RER. Yeah, but she has a bra. No, no, she has a bad. No, it's not nudity. I mean, it's not nudity. You yeah, know, I mean, it's, we, we must be accurate. There's just one shot at front on nudity. Otherwise, there's one, two bras. <laughs> yeah. And a uh, bathing suit. Um, well, you know, it's the topic of the film. The topic of the film is uh, this awkward moment of mutation um, and of, the, yeah, rise of your own desire and how these three different types of women we have who are kind of archetypes of the coming of, coming of age film we have the, the 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 captain of the cheerleader the girl who's not yet out totally out of childhood and the chubby friend um and it's three archetypes of the coming of age not not even the french coming of age but actually the american coming of age films but we see them from the other side. They're not portrayed as they're, they're, we used them to be portrayed. We are used to them being portrayed in those films because we actually see the corridors. We see the behind the scenes um, of this girl sharing their intimacy um, from their perspective. So that's the big difference. It's that you share the experience of their own discomfort and desire. You're with them, you're not looking at them. Um, and well, that's already the female gaze, even though I didn't know I was doing that. But uh, I mean, <laughs> well, I, I couldn't put a label on it. Um, and to get that, well, you just have, it's all about sharing the process. It's all about sharing the project. Uh, these three actresses, um, they were committed to what we were telling, and they were playing it. It's not. It wasn't about their own their own discomfort. For instance, Adeline is not the queen of the cheerleaders, especially at that time in her life. She's the awkward. Or she's much more the awkward girl than this rising star. Um, but uh, it's it's a, it's a performance, and we all share the will to tell that story, and um, it's always like that that you you make films. It's about yeah, sharing the project with your collaborators and, and putting themselves into it, you know, and um, so that's how you get the performance by yeah, sharing by being the yeah, all the brains in the room. Um your interview interview okay you already mentioned the triangle you said about free woman. I'm, I was watching it yesterday and I was really curious about the maid. She was so much involved. Mm -hmm. I was discussing it with my friends afterwards and they were talking about social, political aspects like um, this close relation between all the women. But somehow I got the feeling that it helped to build to develop the love. You mentioned that this film is about how the love develops. And for example, my interpretation, sometimes you feel already at the beginning that it's you, you're close to a person, but it's so awkward to be with this person. So that's why this third person is so much involved or there is another. What's your interpretation? This is the first question. Can I ask the yes? <laughs> Can I ask the second or later? No, no. Um, so the second question about the ending, when um, uh, they see each other last time, actually the painter see her and she is listening to music. I couldn't believe it that you are so much into the other person and you can feel the staring, her staring at you. So what's your interpretation? Is, she, is, is it about lost love? Like she's in the past, she's in the memories, that's why she was not able to feel this stare? Or what, 
because yesterday you mentioned that the love is not the possession. Mm -hmm. It's about one moment mm -hmm. and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. So that's the other question. Oh, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, regarding the maid, <clears throat> Um, I wanted to talk about uh, friendship also in the film. Friendship among the love story, between the two lovers, because friendship is a part of um, love, of a love relationship. And I wanted to talk about friendship among these three men, women as a sorority, so as something that abolish also social hierarchy. Um, also wanted to show this, uh, this maid not as a maid character, uh, she's not. She's not even here carrying stuff around. You know, she's not even here with the mother. She should be, you know, in a conventional film. Uh, and I had the temptation. I was like, oh, the maid should be here, and she would be there. And I thought, no, because she's not going to be an object. She's not going to be one of the accessories of the set. Uh, she should be here when she's a character, and she has, you know, a goal, feeling, a perspective uh, on the situation. Um, also, didn't want her to be in the traditional role of the servant in the theater, like in especially the theater at that time or the or the, the before the 17th century, like um, listening to the doors or being the confident or having a perspective on the love story. I wanted her to have her own journey, and especially this journey with the abortion and the community of women on the island. Um, so it was a way to treat her the same as the, the, the other character. And to me, the mother is also a part of that group. I mean, of course, she, when she leaves, the film is much more funnier because she embodies uh, domination. But um, I wanted her to, have, to be straightforward, uh, not to be mundane, and also her not to be this bitter old woman, but to be a 50-year-old woman, a young woman, still, you know, with her own project, her own desire, and um, to portray this age, you know, and that's also why I wanted a 17, 30 years old, and 50-year-old woman that we never see on screen. You never see a 50-year-old 50 50-year-old woman on screen. And it's the women that are actually going to the cinema. So it's like a total paradox, even regarding the box office. <laughs> if you're cynical, you make a movie about a 50-year-old woman. No, but um, it's true. I think it's, it really tells a lot, the fact that there's an, such an invisibility of middle-aged women in cinema. Um, yo, hey, you're 50? <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Um, and what uh, the other question? This is the last shot of the film, and Yes, it begins as there's a tension of a shot, reverse shot. You want them to look at each other. But she, uh, the, person, the character of Marianne actually gives you the hint that this is not going to happen. She's telling you there's no suspense. She didn't see me. Um, and she's saying that so that you can totally abandon yourself to that very long take. It's two minutes and 51 seconds. It's long. And it's long not because we want to put out a performance, uh, but because within that take, you're escaping the relationship between the two characters. It's not about, is she going to look back? It's about you watching this scene, and in the process, this scene unveils itself at cinema. I believe that at a certain point, and I think this point is a minute, you begin not to watch Eloise being watched by Marianne, but you're watching Adèle Haenel performing in a film and doing an amazing performance in a film. And it's, it's, a, it's about cinema. It's about you being in a theater seat, just as she is. And and you enjoying art as a consoling thing, and you having room for yourself and for your own love stories and for your own space in the film, because that's also what we're trying to do. We're trying to create an active viewer, somebody who's authorized, whose place is in this room. 
And that's why this take is so long, that you you re-enter the fact that it's cinema. I think you you never left the room. I mean, we know it's cinema. We're watching cinema, and that's what moves us. And that's when fiction cons consoles us. It's because there's a room for you, and that's why that's why there's no suspense. That's why she doesn't. She's not going to look back because you're looking at her. Does anyone have a fun question? Because we've been so very serious. We haven't yeah, I know. drunk enough, maybe? Maybe about men? <laughs> that was, <laughs> people were laughing when we were talking about representation of men. It's a question about pain. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was interested in the role of the pain in your movies. I mean, I saw yesterday a portrait and today water lilies, and there were two scenes. One is an abortion scene, and the other is the uh, trying to lose a virginity scene. So, uh, this kind of female vulnerability, when it, uh, yeah, this basic. Uh, human vulner uh, with female vulnerability it's um, I interpreted it like a like a potential to kind of for a sisterhood or something this is how you um, I didn't get what you just said sorry oh um, it you was, interpreted it as yeah as a potential for a kind of a sisterhood because yeah. in a first movie it's uh, like they are there for her in this worst moment of a life kind of and in the second movie she is willing to to do that for mm -hmm. a friend so what what's your relationship to the pain <laughs> well sisterhood is, is the pain that's for sure um i don't see those scenes up as pain scenes i see those scenes as uh body, bodily, I don't know, and physical scenes. And it's about portraying the body of women uh, and their physicality. Um, um, and what goes through these bodies and from their perspective. Um, and I can't say much, actually, because it's pretty much that. Um, so it's about pain, it's about pleasure, you know, it's, but it's about, yeah, them, them being... Uh, I wish you were French now. <laughs> and that's something I rarely wish for people to be French in front of me, <laughs> especially in festivals. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, so it's not about pain, it's not about, and, and it's, it's, to make, it's actually the opposite, uh, I guess. Uh, it's not about them being multi, and not want, I don't want to show women in pain, I want to show women with that are alive, you know? Um, so yeah, it's about embodying their body. I can't say much than this, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the creative process. So you said you have uh, empathy with your characters. Uh, for example, I watched uh, Mein Leben als Courgette, uh, and um, I found uh, also interesting the figure of the character of Simon, Simon. And um, do you have a favorite? Do you talk with your characters, or how do you create them? Do you carry them with you? Is it an intensive process? Do you feel their pain and their joy? And how, how do you do it? Well, the funny thing is that when I'm asked this question about the characters, it's always like the second character that wins. Like, you you know, you're not talking to me about courgette slash zucchini. You're talking to me about Simon, who is the character I've, I'm, I've, I have a lot of love for this character. And it's also Claude Barra's favorite character. And in Mont de Fille, the personal character of Lady was, so was the second I don't know, do you say that? Second character? Is that the word? 
minor character? Hmm, we hate that. Not the lead. <laughs> supporting. Yeah, thank you. Supporting. And um, in Water Lilies, Adele was the supporting character, you know, and um, um, I guess maybe I'm being supportive in life. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but um, I think the point is that the lead characters in my film are always observer. They are the eyes you go through you go through within the film. They're, you're always watching somebody watching, and they're watching somebody. And so we're all infatu infatuated. That's, yeah, that's okay. Um, with the person they're looking at. Um, but it's also because, yeah, all the movies have one perspective, which is, you know, they're never a choral. You never leave the character's eyes. And, um, I think this creates this kind of weird balance of love, uh, but the lead is not the leader. Um, and also that's a politics within the character, I think. Um, but in the process of writing, I don't consider the characters as person who exist. Like when people tell me, are they gonna see each other? Oh my God, I'm like, they don't exist. <laughs> but they do. I want you to believe they exist, and I'm, I'm counting of you, on, on you to fantasize and, and even write what their, their, their life would be. But I'm not. Um, they're not. I'm not attached to my characters. I'm attached to the films and what they're saying. I'm, I'm attached to my cast more than my characters. Um, there are ideas, there are fiction, and um, and from my perspective, uh, they're, they're not friends. I design them so that they're your friends, you know. But they are just my collaborators, the characters. They don't, you know, they don't. They, I'm not sentimental about, you know, and, not about, and I'm never about psychology of the characters, like I never think about who they are before the backstories, I never think about that, never. Um, like for instance in Portrait, we know that Marianne knew love, that is to say, had, she, we know she had an abortion, she's saying it, so we know that she's been in a relationship, at least a sexual relationship, um, and I never think about that. I'm not like, I didn't, when I read this, I was like, okay, so who was it? How was it? It doesn't exist. I'm always trying to write in a very behaviorist way uh, and not psychological way. So I'm not writing like the whole life of the character in a little secret um, diary. This doesn't exist. But it's, I think it's, but I, but I pray and hope for you to do it. You know, it's not that I can condemn it. It's just that in the process of, working, it has to be about what you tell, what you show, uh, and, you know, sometimes you can be self-indulgent with uh, imagining characters like, like people who exist, it's not true, I mean, it's, it's ideas, and, and it then it's, it's work on the set and on the, so I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not having this sentimental relationship with, with them, but love them very much, though. So feel free to add your own fan fiction to Please the do. existing CMA universe, because she appreciates it so much. Thank you so much. We're running out of time for now. Thank you so much. Thank you.